Thank you, Pastor. Um, I'm just honored to be here. I mean, what a blessing to uh, stand here before you and just have an opportunity to share my vision and, and the mission that God has put in my heart. And it's not very often that a pastor will allow you time on his pulpit, you know, with very little uh, information about you. So it is a real blessing, uh, as I say, to be here. And I'm just going to take a few minutes and and to share with you a little bit about what I'm doing, why I'm here, why I have that big RV parked out there to begin with, and, and why it's so important to me, and I hope uh, will be as important to you as well when you hear this story. But I don't know how many of you have heard, have heard this expression before, that there are only two defining forces in this world willing to lay their lives down for you. Jesus Christ for your soul and the American soldier for your freedom. Amen. And I will tell you that on December 30th of 2005, two uniformed soldiers came to my front door with five very simple words. We regret to inform you. My son had been killed the day before, on the 29th, by a sniper's bullet in Fallujah, Iraq. I will tell you that that is the worst day of any family's life. The devastation of that is beyond uh, belief, beyond e expectation. There's nothing you can prepare for. It's not something you can think about. It's, some, it's not a direction you even want to go. But I will tell you, there is no bigger word. Devastation isn't big enough, as you can imagine. And God took me in a very special place from there, and it was very difficult for me to, to, to understand that. But, in the grieving process, and you know we all know the stages of grief, there are some very particular things that you go through. One of them is memories, because you know you will never make those new memories again. I would never see my son walk through that door. I would never hear his voice on the telephone. And what you do with that takes very different shapes and forms for many different individuals. But God showed me something very important, which gave me such a peace. It is that peace that goes beyond understanding. Because within two weeks of that, God came to me, and he said, I want you to know, George, very specifically, that I know exactly how that feels. I know that pain of loss, because I lost my son too. And I want you to know, that your son and my son are with me today in paradise. Amen. Amen. Now what that did to me was totally unexpected. But I knew that as parents, our job is to get our kids to heaven. Really, that's the ultimate goal, that eternal resting place. And so I knew with a calmness that yes, I would see him again. And God began to give me a heart now for those families that had lost children and husbands and loved ones before my son. And I began to think about the pain and the anguish and the process that they have gone through. You see, when someone loses a loved one in war, you know, we often pray for our troops and we remember that they're still out there. But really the entire message is, and remember to pray for those who will never have their loved ones at the table again. Because that is forever. They will carry that the rest of their lives. And I began to go out and to visit other families and attend funerals, memorial services after my son. Because God had now burdened me to be able to reach out, to be able to speak to them and say, you know, I'm there. I know exactly what you're feeling. I'm here for you. And as I began to meet those families from Iraq and Afghanistan, I began to meet other families from Vietnam. Grenada, from Korea, from World War II. And I began to, to see that their cry was the same over and over, regardless of generation. And that cry was, please don't let this have been in vain. Come on. And please don't let them be forgotten. Those are the only two most important things that these families were feeling. Because you know why? My son was married. He had two children. He went to college. 
He had several jobs before he joined the army. He could have stayed here and lived his life. He could have stayed here and raised his children. He could have had a great job and made a difference here in the United States. But no, he decided like so many thousands of young men and women to serve this country. Amen. To do something that many of us can't do, that many of us won't do. But yet we need them, those selfless individuals who will put their lives on the line for all of us. And that's what he did, so it's a different kind of death. And the one thing that these families expect of anything is to be thanked. They want gratitude. They want to know that it was not in vain. And so I began to think about that. And I began to wonder, why is it that any family would ever think that a sacrifice had been in vain? And then I realized, as I thought back into the Vietnam era, as to how those men and women were treated when they came home, very, very unappreciated. And they needed to be remembered. And I realized that the politics of, of, of this country sometimes makes those individuals feel as if they're second class citizens, you know, that they're not appreciated. And I knew that that had to change. And how could we make this country remember? Do you realize that as a nation, what happened at 9-11? Do you remember 9-11, everyone? Well, on 9-12 and 9-13, you couldn't find an American flag in this country. They were all gone. You couldn't buy one anywhere. But three months later, six months later, those flags were tattered, they were faded, they were taken down, and they were never put up. The only ones that put up American flags six months later were the ones that had them up before 9-11. And that is a very serious uh, shortness of memory. I think in this country. And you know when we remember our fallen? On Memorial Day. That's the day we all have. We all think to ourselves, hey, when we lose someone, it's really tragic, it's really sad. But we're going to remember them on Memorial Day. Well, you know, we live under the freedoms of this country every single day. The freedom to worship, the freedom to move about the country like we want to, the freedom to bear arms, the freedom to protest. We live under those freedoms every day. Why is it that we only get to remember those that gave up those freedoms one day a year? Mm, that seemed like a void in this country. And I thought, well, what is the best way to get this country's attention? How can we give them some way to remember that there is a price for freedom? And it is a costly one. And on May the 26th of 2008, I decided what this country was missing was an emblem of sacrifice. The honor and remember flag was created to be a national symbol, much like the POW flag was created, to remember those that were missing or captured. This flag was created to be a national symbol of remembrance. There is a bill in Congress right now to establish this as a national symbol. I have been traveling the United States for the last five months, driving that big <coughs> RV out there with a message of remembering those that gave their lives for this country. And one by one, state by state, I've been now in 46 states. 45 of those states have decided to make this a state symbol of remembrance and to fly this in honor of their fallen and their families, recognizing that sacrifice. Very quickly, and then I'm going to pass the, turn back over to you. The symbolism behind this flag, so when you see it, you'll know, and you'll know you heard it from me. The red field is, stands for the sacrifice of bloodshed in this country. The white field beneath the purity of that sacrifice, because every one of our men and women to a person said, don't worry, I've got it covered, I'll be back. The blue star in the center goes back to World War I when a blue star banner was hung on windows and doors of military families, letting people know they had someone in active duty. The gold star in the center, which I hope you will remember, is where we get the term gold star family. You have a gold star family in this church. It means that that life was lost and they weren't coming home. The folded flag beneath the stars, you understand, 
is a life lost in military service to this country. The flames are above the eternal flames. And the words below, we will always honor their sacrifice and remember them specifically by name. But my mission, my mission is to touch lives, and it's more than just about a flag flying in the wind. Master, am I okay? You'll see that this flag is personalized. It is my goal as an organization to present every family, regardless of generation, with a personal tribute and thanks for that sacrifice. And I've been around the country in many states presenting flags. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock on the steps of the state capitol, I'll be presenting a flag to a Vietnam daughter who lost her father in 1969. Uh, 10 o'clock, just so you remember that. Now, just to let you know that this ministry is, is going to a people group, if you will, that is often forgotten, very often forgotten, and needs to be remembered in a very special way. And that's really all the time I have. I'll be here after the service. Uh, the website, uh, we do have a website. It's just honorandremember.org, honorandremember.org. Very simple to remember. I do have literature in the back and flags even if people are interested. But let me just leave you with one final thought. And you've heard this quote from the Bible, no greater love is a man than to lay down his life for a friend. And I will tell you, you can take that one step further, but there is no greater love than a man to lay down his life for complete strangers for the freedoms that we have today. God bless you. And show me not my own pain and not my own grieving, 
but the grieving of those families that have lost loved ones throughout our country's history. Those mothers and fathers who have sent their sons and daughters, those wives that have sent their husbands out into the fight so that we could have the freedoms that we enjoy every day. And I began to feel their pain. I began to understand what they've gone through. And to understand that it is a different kind of death. Because my son was a, a husband and a father. He was married and had two children. He could have stayed here in this country. He was educated. He, he had many jobs before he joined the army. He could have done anything. But he decided to be a servant. He decided to do what so many don't do or can't do. And that is put their lives on the line for each one of us, so that we're able to have those freedoms that we enjoy every day, the freedom to worship. We are the greatest nation on earth. We are the most free nation on earth, able to do anything we want, literally in this country, including protest, without incrimination. And that's all because of those men and women that have put their lives on the line for us. We're only a new nation, you know, 235 years. That's only really three generations, if you think about it. That's all we are. But yet, we are the helping nation. We are the nation that is always out there to give a hand. And we are the most evangelistic nation. Just think of all we have done for this country. But I wanted to know how this country remembered sacrifice. I wanted to know if they appreciated my son's death. I wanted to know if they appreciated all of our son's deaths. And the one thing that came to me very vividly was that the biggest one-time remembrance that we have in this country is Memorial Day. That's the day we remember. That's the day the government gave us to remember. Yet, I remember every day. And you live under freedoms every day because of that sacrifice. And I thought that was kind of unfair, that everybody got to remember once, and I have to remember all the time. And I thought, how can we get this country to think about sacrifice and just appreciate it? Because the one thing that families want, really just want, of anything you could give a family who has lost someone in this country is thanks. They just want to be appreciated. They want to know that that sacrifice was not in vain and that you won't forget. And I wondered how to do that. How can we get this country to remember? And what came to me was that we needed a symbol. We needed an emblem in this country that when you looked at it, you realized it stood for sacrifice, specifically for that group that didn't come home. Because you know we have flags in this country for everything. Every state has their own flag. Every college has their own flag. Every branch of the service has their own flag. Every high school has their own flag. We have flags that identify groups and organizations for everything, except those that enable us to fly every other flag in this country. They have no symbol, they have no recognition. They get one day a year, and that day is for most people an extra day off from work. And so I thought that that void needed to be filled. And on May the 26th, 2008, I established what is to be a national symbol of remembrance in this country. Yeah, right. There you go. The honor and remember flag established as a national symbol of remembrance, recognizing all lives lost in military service to our country from the beginning of our country's history to the present and beyond. The symbolism behind this flag, the red stands for the sacrifice of bloodshed, the white, the purity of that sacrifice. 
because each one to a person said to their families, don't worry, I'll be back. The blue star in the center goes back to World War I on a blue star banner was hung on the windows and doors of families, letting everyone know they had someone in active duty in the fight. The gold star in the center, again going back to World War I, recognized that that life was lost, that they weren't coming home. The folded flag we all know, a folded flag handed to the family at the memorial of their loved one. The flames, eternal flames, we will never forget, and the words below, we will always honor their sacrifice and remember them specifically by name. There is a bill in Congress right now to make this an official United States symbol of remembrance. And I've been traveling across the country, meeting with different states. This is my 46th state. I've driven 21,000 miles since June the 5th to get to this spot right here. And in the 45 states that I've been in, all 45 states have committed to making this a state symbol of remembrance. And I'm here in Florida for a special ceremony tomorrow at the steps of the state capitol at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning to present a special flag to a family who has lost someone recently in uh, the war in Iraq. But the Lord gave me a little bit deeper understanding of this and a little bit more personal of a mission. And that mission was to touch lives in a very special and personal way. And he enabled me to, to design the flag so that it could be personalized. And if you can see the name on this flag, this flag was made for a mother who lost her son in Korea in 1950. She was 99 years old. The week I was making this flag for her, she passed away, and I wasn't able to present it. But I use that as an example that this flag is for all generations, and the tribute is to reach every family, regardless of generation, and touch their lives in a very special, personal, and public way because it's about the healing. And who better to understand that than a congregation of believers that understand what hurt is all about, and that these families will carry their burden for the rest of their lives as they hunger and yearn to have that relationship with their family members that they will never see again. And I don't have enough time to explain any more to you uh, if you're interested in talking to me anymore, I'll be here for the service. I do have literature in the back and, and also even flags. But the website is simply honor and remember. Honor and remember dot org. Very simple. And I'm going to turn this over to the pastor with just a quote that I used in the last service. A quote that we all know from John chapter 15. No greater love as any man than to lay down his life for a friend. But these men and women have shown greater love by laying down their lives for someone they've never met, for us, and for that freedom that we enjoy. God bless you. If you have a family or friends of a loved one who's lost, 
who's lost a loved one, uh, please go by and uh, just love what our brother shake his hand, get some information, and check out the wonderful things that he's doing in this ministry. Amen. Is that all right? Amen. It's giving time. Glory to God. And remember, since June, he's been traveling across the country in an RV. This is his form. Today he spoke at the Capitol with the governor. This is his 47th state. So he is on the home front coming back. And um, when, uh, when he travels, he likes to, uh, to go to church. And he just was looking for a place to worship. And uh, we found out he was coming here. He's staying with um, Howard and Carol Payne. And, uh, and um, we just asked him to come say a few words to us. And he's traveling the country just to bring remembrance to those that have given their life defending this wonderful country we live in. So with that, please help me introduce Mr. George Lutz. Thank you, Pastor. To your pastor for an opportunity. I didn't realize so many people were in the room here. But uh, let me take a few minutes to share with you a mission that God has put in my heart, and you haven't had the advantage of really knowing who I am or why I'm here or what the heck I'm doing, and so uh, you're kind of a fresh audience in a sense, so I really would appreciate uh, your, I don't know, your sincere thought process about what I'm going to share with you, because it's going to be a little bit something new. You may have heard this phrase before, that there are only two defining forces in this world willing to lay their lives down for you. Jesus Christ for your soul, and the American soldier for your freedom. Now, on December 30th, 2005, the second part of that phrase hit home to me. When two uniformed soldiers came to my door, with five simple words, we regret to inform you. My son, Tony, had been killed the day before by a sniper in Fallujah, Iraq. And what happens when you get words like that is beyond devastating. There isn't a big enough word to describe the emotion of that moment. Honestly, my first thought was certainly they've made a mistake or maybe he's wounded someplace and he's just looking for me to, to go and be with him. But you know that reality sets in pretty quickly. And I realized that he would never walk through that door again. That I would never hear his voice on the telephone. And that's something you can't prepare for. And I will tell you that God took me on a mission, on a journey that I never expected. Yes, I grieved, and I grieved deeply. And there's a certain amount of numbness at first. But I will tell you that within two weeks of that, God spoke to me, and Pastor, I know you're going to talk about chatting with God. God spoke to me very clearly, and he said, I want you to know that I know exactly how you're feeling, because I lost my son too. And he said to me, your son and my son are with me today in paradise. And that gave me a peace that maybe you can't imagine. But it was a peace that I needed at that moment. And it was a peace that enabled me to carry on from that moment forward. Because the two weeks before that, when I had spoken to my son, he told me he had been promoted. He said, Dad, I'm promoted from driver to gunner. And I said... Tony, that doesn't sound like a promotion. That sounds like a target. And he looked, he didn't look at me, but he said to me over the phone, he said, Dad, I will tell you that God is literally my shield. And I couldn't argue with that. And I found out later that the day before he was killed, he was playing ball with his buddies, and he said, you know, if something happens to me, I know I'm going to heaven. Do you know where you're going? And so... I had that peace and realized that he was in that eternal place. He was where we will all be. And, you know, as parents, isn't it our jobs to get our kids to heaven? I mean, really, that is the ultimate destination. And so I felt as if 
I could check one off in a sense. And that was a healing, part of that healing process for me. But what God did in my heart was he took me beyond myself. And he took me to feel compassion for those families now that I knew had lost loved ones that maybe weren't in that same position, weren't comforted in that same way. And as silly as it sounds, as a parent of a fallen soldier, I began to think about generations of parents that have sent their children out to war, not knowing the outcome. And how did they feel? And what, what was, it, was their situation? And I began to attend the funerals of other fallen after my son. Many, unfortunately, I come from Virginia, that have been killed, Navy SEALs and uh, Marines. And I began to speak to those families, and I began to say, I'm here, I'm going through it. I know what that's like. Call me if you need to talk. And as I met those parents, I began to meet other parents from past generations, from the Gulf, from uh, Grenada, from uh, Vietnam, from Korea, from World War II, many sets of, of, of widows and, and mothers and fathers and, and children. And the two things that I sensed from them over and over, every one of them the same, was please don't let this sacrifice have been in vain. And please don't let them be forgotten. The two cries that I would hear most often from every family member. And I thought, why would anyone think that the sacrifice for this nation would ever have been in vain? And then I began to think about my generation of Vietnam and how those soldiers were treated when they came home. And the kind of reception that they got, many of them, you all maybe have been in, in that era and maybe have served during that time, but many having to sneak back in the middle of the night, <clears throat> fly in when nobody was around, so they didn't get spat upon. That was a tragedy in this country, and our soldiers should never have been treated that way. And when I say soldiers, you know I mean airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, all those that served. And I thought to myself, how does this nation remember? How does this nation appreciate sacrifice? Because, you know, I wanted to know that this nation was proud that my son gave his life. I was proud of it. And I went on a search for those tidbits of remembrance, if you will, to find out where we stood as a country. And you know what I found in my, in my research and my searching in the internet is a wonderful thing, is I found monuments and memorials. Watch my time. Monuments and memorials across this country. But what I realized in my search was that those monuments and those memorials were funded, built, and visited by veterans. They were the ones that remembered. And I thought, well, what is the rest of this country doing? Those that will never get to those monuments, probably 90% of the population. And I realized something very important, that if you don't have what's called skin in the game, if you don't know someone in the military, if you don't, you're not in the military, if you haven't lost someone in the military, you don't understand. And so, if you don't have that skin in the game, what we think of as a nation, and I was guilty of that myself, is that we have a day to remember. We have Memorial Day. And I thought, how unfair was that? I have to think about my son every day. And his friends have to think about him every day. And those that serve with him have to think about him every day. How is it that this country only gets to remember the sacrifice of our men and women one day a year? And how many of you maybe think that's just a day off, an extra day of vacation. Most of those that attend the, the ceremonies, the, the parades, again, are veterans. And so I thought, how can we get this country to think about the price of freedom? That price that costs so much, that has taken the lives of so many 
and have left the devastation of the families behind that have to live with that the rest of their lives, those that will never have their loved ones at their table again. How do we get beyond that one day a year? And I thought to myself, what we need is a symbol. What this nation needs is a symbol of remembrance, a collective icon that when we see it, we know that it specifically stands for the sacrifice of those men and women throughout history. And I'm just cutting this really short because I want to be conscious of the pastor's time. But two years ago on Memorial Day, 2008, and I'll be here afterwards if anyone has any questions, that symbol was created. It's called the Honor and Remember Flag. And tonight, tonight on the news, you'll probably see a story about this. But this flag was established to be a national symbol of remembrance. Much like the POW was a flag was established for those that were missing or captured. The Honor and Remember Flag, right now, there is a bill in Congress to make this an official flag of remembrance for the United States. Now, the symbolism behind this flag, very quickly, red stands for the sacrifice of bloodshed for this country, the white beneath the purity of that sacrifice. The blue star in the center goes back to World War I. The blue star was hung on the windows and doors of families that had someone in active duty. The gold star is where we get the term gold star family. It means that that family has lost a loved one in service to our country. You have Gold Star family in this church. The folded flag beneath, we all recognize as a universal symbol of a flag handed to a family at the memorial of their loved one. The flames above, an eternal reminder that we will never forget. And the words below, we will always honor their sacrifice and remember them specifically by name. A bill in Congress wasn't enough. Several states began to call me and say, we want to make this a state symbol of remembrance. We want to fly this in our states for our families and for our fallen. And after a few states did that, I decided that I couldn't wait for the entire country to contact me. I needed to go out and bring this message. And so right after Memorial Day, I began a 50-state journey, traveling by vehicle across the entire United States, ending my journey on Veterans Day in Arlington Cemetery. This is my 47th state. I had a ceremony this morning with the governor, and all 47 states have committed so far to making this a state symbol of remembrance. I have three more to go. And I believe when I reach that point that all 50 states will have made a commitment. Now when this flies, you can see the difference that it's gonna make in this country, because all of a sudden, people are going to start to wonder, what the heck is that? Where did it come from? What does it mean? What does it stand for? And it'll be a chance, I believe, to raise a level of patriotism with some new thought, a new idea, in a way that's never been established before. But God took me a little bit deeper because it's not just about a piece of cloth flying <coughs> in the wind that can still be ignored. It's about touching the lives and healing. And as a church, you know the power of healing. It's about touching the lives of those that have sacrificed so much. You know, it's a different kind of death. To send a young, healthy, educated individual out into a battlefield when they could have stayed home. They could have gotten jobs. They could have raised their families. But no, it's a selfless sacrifice. One that very few will do. Less than 2% in this country but yet it's done, and many of them do not come home. And God showed me that my mission was to touch those lives individually. And the flag itself was designed in another way. It was designed in a way that it could be personalized. <clears throat> and if you look at the name on this flag, a soldier was killed in 1950 in Korea. And God showed me that if we touch the lives of every family who has ever lost anyone in this country, the impact of that would be tremendous. It's an untouched people group. 
because you would be familiar with that phrase. And a powerful, powerful group it is that are so burdened with a grieving of such a precious loss, it's unimaginable. And I have been able to present flags like this for every generation. And my goal is to make a presentation that doesn't have to be, be personal, but to have a flag made for every family who has ever lost a loved one in this country. I presented two flags this morning, one to a Vietnam widow and one to an Iraq uh, war on terror father. And over the course of this trip across the country, I have presented over 100 flags and hundreds before that. And I will tell you, and I don't have the time now, to tell you the power of the, of the testimony of these families, many on the verge of suicide, to have them say to me, after 40 years, somebody remembers that I lost my son. It's unimaginable power. So I'm done. I would ask that you pray for this mission. It is daunting. It is, it is huge. And it will take the power of prayer, I believe, to just, to, if you can imagine having to share what I share and relive that over and over and over again with so many families every day that I have to meet with. But I'm just going to close with this. Thank you, Pastor. I think I'm in 15 minutes. You've heard this phrase, this quote from the Bible, John 15, no greater love as a man to lay down his life for a friend. And I hope in this context of what you've heard tonight, you will realize that there is even greater love for those that lay down their lives for someone they have never met so that we might have all that we have in this country, including the freedom to worship and to evangelize. God bless you, and thank you for the time. Thank you.